And here we go. Okay. So um, with, uh, uh, with the previous lecture, we uh, uh, completed our uh, excursion into uh, the Bayesian uh, setting uh, for uh, uh, reinforcement learning. And uh, uh, so from today, we are going to move uh, uh, towards the uh, uh, more inductive or uh, data-based uh, uh, interpretation of, uh, of reinforcement learning. So all these methods which uh, uh, are relying on uh, uh, data to perform prediction and control. Um, so uh, to, to recap uh, where we are, uh, where we stand, uh, let me draw once more our uh, map which uh, uh, features two axes, our level of knowledge of the model that is underlying our system, uh, the dynamics and the structure of rewards, uh, and our uh, um, uh, observability of the state system itself. Um, and uh, we were sitting uh, here in the upper right corner where we discussed Markov decision processes and uh, the Bellman's equation. And then uh, in the last uh, series of lectures, we've been uh, discussing how to move uh, uh, down along this axis to uh, build up a, a broader uh, uh, theoretical construction, which is this notion of partially observable Markov decision processes, which contain Markov decision processes themselves as a one specific uh, instance uh, that is the instance of perfect of observability but in general when observability is partial we need to uh, combine uh, our uh, planning method with inference in order to be able to plan uh, taking into account the fact that we uh, have to uh, uh, accumulate uh, observations in order to be able to predict in the future. Okay, so this naturally uh, calls into the game uh, uh, the uh, the notion of uh, Bayesian updating, and we've been uh, uh, discussing all this uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, so there are other exercises that can be done uh, with partially observable Markov decision processes, uh, both small and large. Uh, there are some. Uh, uh, applications that one can uh, can think of, uh, algorithmic and more conceptual. So in case you are interested in uh, uh, developing specifically this part of the, uh, the, uh, the core, the course of the classes, uh, just contact me and I can point you to, to further references and uh, maybe it can be a small project for the for the exam if you are interested in, uh, in that particular in that Bayesian uh, setting. All right, uh, but now we're going to take a, a, a very different path. So we're going to move uh, uh, in the horizontal here. Okay, so remember that eventually we would like to come somewhere here. That is where uh, the full reinforcement learning problem uh, is sitting, uh, which implies a combination of difficulties uh, that come from uh, lack of knowledge of the model, lack of observability, and all the rest. That is real life. Okay. Uh, so when we move on the horizontal, uh, the radical thing that is changing now is that uh, uh, we give up this notion that we know the model and therefore we can plan. So, so far uh, in, uh, in either of the two flavors, either uh, classical MDP or a partial observable MDP, everything was a problem of planning, okay? So uh, you must think of the decision maker uh, as adopting the mindset of the chess player. Okay, something that uh, ahead of things happening is planning one, 10, no matter how large number of moves ahead of time and trying to uh, deductively include all possibilities somehow and to plan ahead uh, a sequence of uh, decisions, okay, based on these uh, observations yet to come. Okay, so it's a problem of uh, essentially of computation and planning. Uh, but when we move on the horizontal towards the uh, 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 so the upper left part of this diagram, uh, we uh, are explicitly assuming that we do not have all this knowledge about the model. So we have to replace this uh, a priori 
information with some a posterior information. That is now we are really interacting with data. So what the key concept that comes when we move along that direction is that we really now start about talking about learning, okay? It's, uh, uh, and of course, this doesn't mean that we are totally dropping out of the notion of moral uh, completely, okay? And this doesn't mean that uh, there, there is a clear cut uh, uh, frontier between all these methods and techniques. It's just I'm using this uh, approach to uh, uh, simplify, sometimes oversimplify this landscape uh, in order to, so you have some clear uh, landmarks uh, in this uh, 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 in, in this uh, rich landscape. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, there are many methods which are a mixture of several things and words. So it's important, I think, for you to uh, sort of rationalize all these approaches using this, uh, uh, these simplifications. Um, so, uh, so what we're going to do for the next, uh, I guess, uh, six lectures, more or less, is to uh, slowly build up uh, all the concepts and uh, uh, techniques uh, that will lead us uh, to uh, uh, this upper left corner of the problem, which is uh, where uh, uh, techniques uh, that uh, go generically under the name of, uh, uh, let's call it, broadly speaking, model free. learning and control. Well, we have to be careful by what we mean model free, uh, but uh, technically speaking is that we are trying to uh, uh, avoid the assumption that we know what the transition probabilities and what the rewards are in our system. Okay. Uh, what does it mean that we're still keeping ourselves uh, at the top of this graph? It means that we are still assuming that we know the structure of the state space and the actions, okay? So we have some structural information about the system. So we know what the states are. We can observe them exactly. So we know where we are in uh, space, if it's a grid uh, world. Uh, we have this information about the state, uh, but we don't know the, what the rewards are and we don't know what the transition probabilities are, okay? Uh, so we will go through the, some examples uh, uh, in the following to clarify what does that mean to be model free uh, uh, and try to learn and control. Okay. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think uh, uh, that's already a good point to discuss some uh, uh, some examples. Okay. So what do, what do we mean by uh, being here? Uh, yeah. So first example. Uh, Grid world. Okay. So you, you've seen this example several times and we will use it again as a playground uh, to see how to learn to control the systems without knowledge uh, of the model. Uh, so what does it mean to have grid world in a model free setting? Uh, as you re remember, uh, having uh, to solve the Bellman's equation uh, by value iteration in grid world implies that you know uh, what are the consequences of your actions. So where do you move with, with how much probability you move to another tile of your, of your system? Okay, so this is a, as usual uh, depicted as a collection of tiles. And you know also, uh, the average distribution of uh, rewards as you uh, encounter a triplet of states, actions, and new states uh, in the in your in your path. Uh, <clears throat> grid world without a model means trying to understand where to reach the rewards. Okay, so you remember there are uh, some rewards placed somewhere, like here and here. And then there are some regions which are forbidden. Okay, so there might also be some uh, some penalties along the way, right? Which we could call like minus rewards. Uh, so points that you want to avoid, points that you have to avoid, and points that you want to reach. Okay, starting from every place in your in your domain, in your micro world. 
Mm. Now, uh, model-free learning and control for grid world means that you don't have this map. Okay, your map has no feature at all. So forget about this. If nothing like this, you just have an empty map. Does it mean that you, what you have in your hands at the beginning, is just this grid. Okay. So by this, I mean you have some structural information because you know what the grid is. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you that you you are doing grid world in a grid which is uh, I don't know 15 by 10 or in a grid which is uh, 10,000 by 1,000. I give you what the states are and I tell you what the actions are, which could be north, south, east, west, okay, or whatever combination you like. But I'm not telling you so, or you as a decision maker don't know where the rewards are. You don't know where the stumbling blocks are. Okay, all of this is unknown to you. And you also don't know what happens when you take an action. So you don't know if you take north, if you go north, you don't know with which probability you will actually go north. And you don't even know if you will make just one single step north or two steps. All of this is hidden to you. So the only way to uh, uh, discover this uh, and uh, uh, put it to use in order to be able to uh, recover uh, the optimal strategy is to interact with the environment. Okay, so uh, and this requires, of course, to do some trial and error. Okay. So the basic idea is that uh, there we have to formalize this notion of trial and error in terms of uh, attempts. Okay, so trying to do things, uh, collecting information while we do it and optimizing our way of behaving as we learn, okay? So there are two, these two aspects, learning, learning to predict what will happen in the future, first step. So learning to predict and control. These are the two key aspects that we have to deal with. So, in, the, in an MDP, uh, you do that by using a model. So simultaneously, if you solve the Bellman's equation, you are predicting what will happen in the future because you know what's the value of your optimal value function and you're optimizing over it at the same time and you're controlling. In policy iteration, you're doing alternate steps. You're improving your prediction by evaluating the new value function and you're improving your policy by going to the next step. But this is, again, it's just computation. Here, we have to learn to do it by collecting information as we, as we act, okay? So, uh, second example, again, bandits. What does it mean to be model-free with bandits? Uh, well, it's, it's very simple. The, the idea is that uh, uh, when I tell you that uh, you are doing with coins, okay, so Bernoulli bandits, I'm already giving you a model because I'm telling you the outcomes will be zeros and ones. I will tell you how the rewards are done. I'm telling you that how the transition probabilities are constructed, okay? So for instance, being model free in bandits might be that some of, some of the information is known. For instance, uh, uh, I could tell you that uh, uh, these are uh, sort of stationary uh, slot machines. It says that they don't change their distribution no matter what you do. Okay, I might tell you this. So this is information about the model, but at the same time, the probability distributions of your states given the action is totally unknown, which means that I don't, you don't even know if it's Bernoulli, okay? Maybe that if you pull an arm, you get zero, one, or maybe two, or maybe 100. So you totally don't know what the distribution is. Could be 
uh, Manoli, could be Gaussian, could be whatever. You have to discover that. Okay. So the level of knowledge that you have is significantly less than the previous case. It's not totally model free in the sense that I'm telling you that, okay, these lot machines don't change over time. But there's also, you might also want to address the more difficult problem in which you say, okay, I'm not even telling you, the, telling you this. Uh, so maybe overnight, the, 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 the the, the, the casino uh, owner changes the slot machine. So you, you were playing a slot machine and then you the day after you think you're playing the same slot machine, but it has changed, okay? So this might also be a, a more even more complex model-free problem, but already the one when you, you're given this, so this is okay, but this distribution are not known is already changing in itself, challenging in itself, all right? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, it's important that, that we sort of delineate the path we are we are going to take. So for bandits is unknown class of probability distributions. Can I uh, ask something? Yes, please. But here we will have a knowledge of the history. We will have another? We will have a knowledge of the history. We need to have some way to uh, collect our information. Yes, as we play, we have to write down what has happened in one way or another, okay? So yeah. our policy will be a function of the history, but this is a, about the real history of events that are happening when I interact with the environment. It's not like in Bayesian, in the Bayesian case where it's a, a list of possible histories to be seen in the future. It's something that has already happened and you just taking notes, okay? So yeah. it's a frequentist approach in this case. Is that, was that the question you were asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Thank right. you. Sure. Okay, very good. Um, so um, how do we move uh, from here to here? Okay, from uh, uh, this situation to this one. Uh, so, in order just to explore the different possibilities, uh, let us let us start by uh, uh, recalling what we know. So, we know that if we have an MDP, we can solve the problem by solving the Bellman's equation. Okay. So, uh, one possibility. is to uh, uh, to be here in the middle and to collect information about your system okay so to interact with the environment you do things you choose some policy and you start doing things and as you do things you keep a record of what has been happening and you use this record to construct the model okay so the flow of uh, uh, of this uh, sort of conceptual attempt would be uh, collect data, build a model, solve Bellman. Can you see that the idea is if I collect data about my environment, I can construct an empirical model and I can use this model to solve the approximately the Bellman's equation that comes from this model. Okay, so how does it work in practice? Uh, so for instance, in practice, uh, what you would do is that uh, uh, you remember, for instance, uh, uh, for, for transition probabilities, okay? Uh, so what is the probability of transitioning from uh, a state S to a state S prime given an action A. So what is it in practice? Well, uh, in practice, this is uh, uh, the expected value, okay? Suppose you had to compute this quantity uh, by making a Monte Carlo simulation of your system, of your Markov chain. What would you do? Well, uh, you would say, okay, uh, every time that uh, uh, my transition brings me to a new state S 
at time t plus one, which is equal to s prime, I put a one. Okay, and this is I do this every time that uh, my previous state was s and that my action was a. Okay, so this is another way of writing the transition probability. You see that? Uh, and this is a conditional pro conditional expectation, okay? Uh, which is in fact the probability. So it's actually uh, the ratio of uh, the joint probability times the probability of the event over which we are conditioning, okay? So uh, this is also equal to uh, the expected value of what? Of unit, if the three things happen, divided by the expected value Oops, sorry. Okay, so what do we have here? Uh, at the numerator, we have a function which uh, is one only if and only if the triplet uh, state action and state prime is exactly s, small s, small a, small s prime. Okay, so every time that in my trajectory, in the, my diagram, every time that I work over this triplet s a s prime, I count one. Okay, and I divide this by the total counts of the times that I was starting from small s and small a. Okay, uh, do do you all agree with what I'm writing here? So this is just a way to rephrase transition probabilities in terms of events that are occurring along one specific trajectory of my system. Okay, if you are happy with that, then uh, the idea is that uh, now we're gonna construct, suppose that we have now uh, N trajectories. Okay, by a trajectory, I mean a sequence, uh, state, uh, action, new state, Sorry. Okay. New action, new state, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is one trajectory, and I have n of them. Okay. So let's uh, put a, a label i here. Okay. With i goes from one to n. So what, what am I doing here? I take my system with a, some policy. I don't specify it what it is, doesn't matter, as long as it produces actions. And I start from a state, pick a, an action from my policy and observe a new state. And then I pick another action, observe a new state. And I do this, and this will be my, my i equals one trajectory. And I repeat that, starting from a new state, perhaps whatever, depending my initial distribution of states. I pick one at random and then I start over again with the same policy. Then I construct a large, possibly large number, capital N of trajectories. And then I can construct from this an empirical model. Okay, so this is what I would call my empirical transition probability. What is that? Well, I'm just replacing, I'm just going to replace these uh, expectation values with the empirical means. Okay, so this is defined as some i going from one to n of the objects which are to be counted. Okay, this is just the number of counts, basically, what I'm putting here on. Uh, the numerator, and this is another number of counts. Okay. 
And then, as you can easily imagine, I can do the same thing for the rewards. Okay, so I can construct empirical rewards for the triplet state action state, which are uh, just uh, as you can easily imagine. This is the reward that I experience, uh, the stochastic reward. So this is what happens if I do one trial. So the, here I uh, sort of forgot that I have all these indices for the uh, uh, the realization for the attempt. So at the uh, trial number I, I see a reward T plus one if uh, I happen to be on the triplet uh, S prime S A. And this again has to be normalized now by the time, the number of times that I visited that state, that triplet, sorry. Okay, so this is the empirical rewards. These are the empirical rewards. Hello. So this is accomplishing our first part, that is collecting data, okay? So with some, with some policy given, okay? So there is no optimization here, okay? There's no, trying to optimize over the policy. We just choose one policy, for instance, for instance, random. So we pick action at, actions at random at every time. We do stuff without trying to optimize. We act totally at random and we collect data, okay? Uh, so no attempt at optimizing, but with that, we, we build a model for uh, rewards, and the transitions. And now with this, we can use this to solve the Bellman. Okay. So is the, the path clear? It makes sense. Okay. It's uh, it's what you actually do a lot, lots of times in physics, right? You collect data with an experiment, then you will up, build up a model according to that experiment. And then you ask questions, okay, what can be improved about the system? Uh, what, how, how do I optimize uh, uh, the, the functioning of my engine, for instance? Okay, I collect data, I, I construct a model of what is happening and I use this model in order to infer in a way or another, how to improve my the performance of my engine, okay? So it makes perfect sense. What could possibly go wrong? And actually the answer is a lot, okay? So uh, uh, there are some critical issues with this approach. Uh, which doesn't mean that the, these issues cannot be solved. It's just like uh, the way I laid it out, it's just collect data and then use the Bellman equation is not the proper strategy. It has to be modified somehow, okay? So what is the problem? Uh, let's go back to the, to the problem of bandits. Look at bandits. Uh, so we're now going to ask a simplified version of this uh, of this question uh, in the sense that uh, suppose you know uh, that these are uh, honest bandits, okay? So they they are stationary in the sense that the states don't change. Okay? So you know already something about the model but you don't know the rewards, okay? That's, that's our assumption, okay? Uh, then let's say that you have uh, uh, 
two armed bandit. Okay, so what would this plan amount to be doing? Okay, so like I said, we don't need to construct a model for the transition probabilities because we know them, but we have to construct a model for the empirical rewards. But what are the empirical rewards here? Okay, so the states don't change, so you don't care. The only thing that matters here is what actions are you taking? Okay, so in practice, uh, in this case, your model of the actions you're taking is just you collect the rewards that you get when you do that action. And you divide by the number of times that you've taken that action. Okay, so this amounts to say that I repeat my experiments with whatever choice of actions, random, for instance. I repeat it 10 times and then I collect uh, rewards. And I put these rewards into a vector uh, with an entry which is uh, equals the current action that I'm taking, the current arm that I'm pulling, the current coin that I'm uh, tossing. And I divide by the number of times that I pulled that coin. Okay. So, but this is just nothing but the empirical average for that coin, okay, out of an experiments. Right? So at this point, I need to solve the Bellman equation with the empirical averages that I have so far. And the Bellman's equation tells me that uh, the best action to take is just uh, the argmax. For instance, if I have just two coins, uh, the argmax of the empirical average for the first coin and the empirical average for the second coin. Okay. So to recapitulate, if I apply this strategy of building a model and solving the Bellman's equation for the two-armed bandit, whatever distribution of the rewards we have, what I do is just, okay, I decide, let's go for n coin tossing or whatever. I mean, it need not be coins, okay, whatever. Uh, I go for n extractions, capital N, and I observe empirical averages for one option and for the other. I compare these two options and then I, I decide that the best action to go is the one determined by the empirical average, which is the largest. But this is nothing but something that we already discussed is the basically the explore then commit algorithm that we've been discussing maybe at the first lecture. Okay. And this is clearly not a good idea. Why is that? Well, because it might happen just by, because out of bad luck, it may just happen yeah. that what was the best option in over 10 trials or over 100 trials, it may seem to be the worst option, okay? So suppose you have coins, there is a finite probability that after 100 tosses of the coins, if your coin number one was uh, at a bias of 0 0.6 and your coin number two had a bias of 0 0.4, it's possible that the coin number two seems to be the best after 100 trials. Okay, of course, if the two coins are very different, this probability will go down very fast. Actually, it goes down exponentially with the number of trials, the probability that you miss uh, misclassify these two coins. And the rate at which it goes down, it's given by the, uh, by the kulbach leiber divergence between the two distributions, okay? So if the two are very different, uh, this uh, probability of misunderstanding one coin for another gets very quickly low. But if the two events are, sorry, if the two parameters are very close, if two bias are very close, you need a lot, a lot of attempts in order to be able to tell apart which is which. And you don't know that in advance because you don't know the model, okay? So you clearly see that there is a, a, a pitfall in this uh, uh, mechanism, uh, which tells you that you have to do something better here, okay? And what you have to do better uh, 
is in fact that you have to intervene uh, at this level. So when you go from here to here, you have to account for, you need more exploration. So in practice, uh, what happens is that you have to modify your model by taking into account uh, your uncertainty about what you've seen so far, okay? So you have to sort of introduce uh, some additional bonus that accounts for how confident you are in your model. Okay. So at this stage, uh, I'm not going very deep into this uh, because we are gonna do something different from the start. This is just to tell you that uh, a very, a very naive approach to the problem of optimization based on uh, uh, empirical knowledge uh, is very risky. And actually it, it is doomed to fail even in very simple situations. So one has to be extremely careful when one mixes optimization with the empirical objects. If you want from a formal viewpoint, the trick, uh, the problem, the tricky part of it is, is that uh, uh, you want to perform a maximum operator, which is strongly nonlinear, of an average. Okay, so you take an average of something and then you take a maximum. But this procedure is switching the, the two terms because you're taking the max before you have completed the average, of course, because you have a finite sample. Okay. So these kinds of problems are very common in machine learning. When you deal with optimization, in presence of a finite sample, you have to be extremely careful. And this is, if you wish, just another instance in which the problem becomes particularly conspicuous, okay? So this was just to tell you that uh, uh, you can go this way, okay? You can go uh, somewhere here and build a model. But this requires particular care because you have to build a model, uh, modify accounting for confidence, statistical confidence. That is how many times did I actually observe that thing? Uh, what is the, my range of confidence that I have in that variable? You need statistics in order then to move to solving Bellman equation, the modified one. And then you have algorithms that uh, are approaching the solution of your problem, okay? Uh, but as a matter of fact, this is all this part that I described to you is on one side to uh, make you aware that there is uh, a path to uh, solving the Bellman's equation with empirical data, but also to tell you that we are not gonna do that because there's another way of doing which basically uh, bypasses this problem. So it takes a path directly from uh, collecting the data to solving the Bellman's equation without building a model. Okay, so all of this part was actually a, a motivating uh, uh, example to, uh, uh, to approach this problem for a very different angle. So the plan for the next six lectures is how to do this. So how to introduce methods that just by trial and error, by interacting with the environment, find provably convergent solutions to the Bellman's equation. So in short, how to solve the Bellman's equation without knowing what the model is. And you remember the Bellman's equation is, is a nonlinear equation in which the, the parameters of the equation, so the, uh, are the model, okay? So you're asking quite a, what seems to be a very difficult question. So solve an equation without knowing with, what are the coefficients in this equation. But what I will try 
to show you today and in the following days is that this is indeed possible and it's also possible to do that efficiently, which is the uh, cornerstone of temporal difference methods. Okay. Uh, so before taking a break, uh, this was the first point uh, that uh, I wanted to highlight, uh, in which I'm going to write here for, for future reference as well. Uh, I managed to get a hold of this. So solve Bellman's equation without knowing the model. Okay. So uh, like I said earlier, solving the Bellman's equation is uh, 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 trying to tackle two problems at the same time, prediction and control, okay? So in the end, we will describe uh, algorithms that solve these two problems together. So you will be able to write down a code that uh, learns how to predict and control at the same time through learning. But uh, in order to make uh, the ideas clearer, uh, for now, we are gonna just split these two problems into parts. And in the following, so today and tomorrow and in the tutorial, we now focus on prediction first. Okay, so for this first part, uh, first, let us assume that we are given or we choose a policy pi. And we are not interested yet in optimizing over this policy. We just want to learn. So the question is, learn the value function of this policy without a model. Can we do that? It's clearly a scaled down version of the full problem because we are not asking what is the best policy and what is the best value function. We're not looking for optimality yet. We're just looking for what does it mean to learn the value function of some, something without a model. Okay, so that's that's the plan that we that's ahead of us for the next two lectures, three, two, two three lectures. Any question about the overall plan? Uh, just in the in the first part of optimality, when you yes, uh, you, you stop me when you. When you're okay with the slides. No, 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 just a general question, not about okay, slides. Okay. Okay. So, uh, it's not optimal even if for uh, like a large number of trials or anything. Okay, you're asking about uh, the fact that uh, if uh, uh, what I told you that uh, it doesn't it doesn't give you an optimal solution. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is that uh, uh, there is there is a there clearly is a dependence in the limit. Okay. Uh, the problem is that uh, the uh, number of uh, uh, experiences of episodes, capital N, that you have to produce in order to be sure that your optimization is correct, depends on uh, the gap between uh, the actual averages. Okay. So uh, if your two coins are uh, 0.49 and 0.51, you then you will need longer. hundreds of trials. But if they are just split apart by 1,000, then you will need a million trials, okay? Roughly speaking, because it goes like the square root of the number of trials, the precision uh, the inverse of the square root of n. So the problem is that you don't know this in advance. So what you want to do is, uh, just to give you the idea, is as you try, so okay, continuously update this knowledge. So don't rely on something like I need capital N trials. I, I keep on computing and while I compute, I increasingly do more of what I think is best, but still keeping some room for exploration of what it ap appears to be worst, but maybe it's not, 
So you want to do this dynamically online. Okay. Thank you. Sure, no problem. All right. So I think it's a good time to stop and take a break. We can uh, start again at uh, five past 10 sharp. Okay. See you later. Excellent. So, uh, so we, we will we'll now start laying out the uh, 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 all the necessary techniques to address uh, uh, this first question. That is, uh, how do we learn uh, the value of a policy without having a model at hand? Okay, just by uh, by trial and error, if you wish. Uh, so the uh, the first thing that you you have to realize that uh, here. Uh, by separating the two problems, we have been uh, uh, sort of getting rid of, of a lot of uh, the issues uh, uh, that I was discussing before, in the sense that uh, if we don't care about optimization for the first uh, part, at least, uh, then we can use Monte Carlo in order to uh, predict the value of a function. Okay, so there, there, is, there is one easy solution of this problem. Uh, so answer one. Use Monte Carlo. So what does that mean? Well, uh, in our specific case, uh, uh, we just have to remember that the value of a policy is just the expected value of the sum of the discounted rewards. Okay. Uh, conditioned on the fact that uh, the state the initial state as node is small s. Okay, that's the definition of the value function. What I do I expect on average if, uh, just to be explicit, if I pick actions according to the policy and I pick new states according to my transition probability, Okay, that's all I need to specify. And my rewards, if you wish, also my rewards are t plus one. Also, they depend on the joint probability distribution uh, of rewards and states here. So it's kind of confusing. Okay, so these two dots means that there are two variables here, which are the rewards and uh, uh, the uh, uh, new states depending on the previous actions and uh, states. Uh, okay, so uh, 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 for any policy, I just can implement Monte Carlo. That is, I pick a state S and I run my system, uh, my model. I don't need to know what uh, the transition probabilities are. So as long as I have samples, I can compute approximations, right? So uh, it's just pretty much like I did before. Uh, I can construct an estimate of this, which is just the empirical average of this uh, sum of discounted rewards. Okay, so this is just going to be the empirical average. I'm not writing the formula because uh, I think you understand the idea, uh, and this is this is fine. As long as I don't have to optimize, this is perfectly fine. Okay, so we could stop here and uh, say, okay, problem solved. We have a way to compute the value of a function approximation. Of course, if we increase uh, the number of trials, we will be uh, improving our uh, precision pretty much like one over square root of n. And uh, in the end, after we have collected a certain number of trials, we have a good uh, approximation, provably convergent in the number of trials uh, to the uh, actual value of the function, okay? So what's, what's not okay with this? So there are uh, two, actually two issues, uh, which are not a deal breaker, okay? So it doesn't mean that this method doesn't work, it means that uh, there are two reasons for which we might want to look for something better than this. Okay, 
So since today I see you're a little bit uh, um, sort of uh, sleepy, uh, I'm, I'm trying to involve you a little bit. So I'm gonna ask you for a suggestion. So can you identify a, a couple of reasons by which, uh, uh, why not Monte Carlo? I, I will list the advantages. So the advantages of Monte Carlo is that uh, this object is uh, uh, unbiased. Okay. Which means that uh, uh, the expected value of uh, hat B is equal to the true expected value. Okay. This is what an unbiased estimator is is a, a quantity which is constructed from uh, empirical observations whose average over the distribution of observations is exactly as the expected value of the random variable that uh, is underlying, okay? So it's unbiased, it's very nice. It's simple, it's easy. I mean, I zero formula, okay? And we could wrap up and go home and say, we're happy with this. So it's simple and uh, uh, and it's unbiased, but, so what's the but? Can you, can you come up with ideas why this might be? So think about how, how you would do it. Suppose I give you grid world with the 1000 states and gamma equals to 0 0.99, which means an horizon of about 100. Okay, so after roughly 100 steps, the problem is uh, quickly fading out because you have uh, either killing of the process or discounting of the rewards. Okay, so think about how you would do it in a code. You would sit down and say, I have to, as I say, I, I'm giving you the random policy. So at every point of your grid world, you take actions at random. Okay, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth in each direction. And I'm asking you, you don't know what the, uh, where the rewards are. You don't know where the stumbling blocks are. You just have to experience. So uh, I can, in practice, the way it works is just that, that like I act as an environment, okay, or the program. So there's a hidden part in, of the program, a hidden function in which you, if you interrogate this function, this function will return you the new states and the new rewards, but you don't see how they are generated. You just see the outcomes, okay? That's, that's the name of the game. You don't know the model. I know it, I, I produce the function, which you cannot read but you can read the outcomes of this function. Professor? Yes, please. Um, so we calculate the empirical average and in Monte Carlo, we need to know the empirical average that was calculated in the previous step, right? Um, or well, maybe I'm confusing. We are, we are, okay. We are perhaps running a bit ahead of schedule here. Uh, oh. So, what, what do you mean exactly in the previous step? Uh, um, is it still a Markov decision process? Okay, we are, we are approaching that. Yeah, right. So we are start getting close with, with these questions. Okay. So Haya implicitly touched upon exactly the, the, the points that I want to insist on. Uh, it's still in the form of questions. Okay, so let's try to uh, expand a little bit on this. So let me... Let me finish with this description of these uh, thought experiments that we're doing. So we start from a state and we have to produce our simulation. So you interrogate the Oracle, uh, which is this function, which gives you states and rewards and you go on and on and on. And at some point you stop because your discounting is going down and then you will have to restart from a, the same state. If you have, want the value function at that state and produce another sequence of this, okay? So, so, um, I, I don't know how to formulate the answer right now, but I, I see the problem with it. Okay, uh, there, and I, there's, there's one problem which is actually borders on trigger. That's why I, I, I think you, you're not uh, uh, identifying it because maybe it's too simple. And the, the first thing is that, <laughs> This is damn, damn expensive. It's long, okay? If the horizon is, if gamma is 0 0.99, you have to run 100 steps for every state 
a large number of times in order to kill the, the uncertainty. So Monte Carlo is long and it has a high variance. It has a high variance because for every point you have a large number of possible trajectories. Okay, Some trajectories may miss the target. Some others may go on the target several times and quick. So the possible outcomes of this sum here in general may be very different. And you have to sum collect over many, many trajectories in order to make this quantity converge to its average. Okay. So in general, Monte Carlo methods are fine because they are unbiased and simple, but you have to pay a price, which is a price in uh, computation, in efficiency, uh, in terms of realizations, uh, et cetera. So one, this, one question. Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? If I understood well, since I never encountered Monte Carlo also in my bachelor, okay. is Monte Carlo is to uh, follow a specific path and to cover all the possible paths that I have in my problem? Okay. So what, what I mean by Monte Carlo is actually, uh, sorry for the jargon. It, it's okay if you stop me at any time, you keep me something that is not you're not familiar with. So by Monte Carlo, I mean just uh, simulating your, your system, okay? So you just, uh, that, that's exactly what you would do if I told you uh, here, I'm giving you a routine, a function that if you provide me as a user, your current state and action, which you choose, okay? You choose an initial state, you choose an action and my function gives you the next state and the reward, okay? And then by Monte Carlo means that you're just gonna take in these things and call my function again, okay? And so you produce trajectories. That's what Monte Carlo means. You just produce trajectories with some generic model that you might or might not know. In this case, you don't know, it's hidden to you. Is that clear? Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. And do we use some kind of sampling to overcome this problem? Do, you, do we use some? Sampling. Sampling? Sampling, yeah. Um, I mean, okay, you could use some trick like importance sampling to improve on over this, okay, which is one way of uh, improving. And this is also canonical uh, in, uh, in uh, Monte Carlo methods. So you use some other distribution uh, in order to produce your data and then you compensate for the difference between the two distribution. This is a very useful trick, but that's not quite what we're gonna do here, okay? Uh, what we're gonna do here, this, this important sampling trick also is very general. So another thing that uh, Haya was pointing out, is, she asked, is the problem still an MVP? Is this still Markovian? Because Monte Carlo is totally agnostic with respect to that, okay? It's only when I tell you the procedure that you give me a state, I give you back a function. But if you ask the system, give me a trajectory, you could run Monte Carlo, without knowing if it's Markovian or not, okay? So Monte Carlo method doesn't care about this if the system is Markovian or not in itself. But we know that our system is Markovian, so we are not leveraging on that, okay? So this is something which makes Monte, Monte Carlo again, very powerful, very general, but also less efficient, both from a practical and from a conceptual point of view, because it's not leveraging on some knowledge that, that we have, okay? So the two points that push us to go beyond is that uh, Monte Carlo is a, a sort of uh, expensive. Well, and does not fully leverage on Markov. On the structure of the Markov problem. Okay, so uh, what what we want to do now is to use something that we have already obtained before. Okay, so we want to recast the problem uh, of uh, uh, estimating the value function because that's a statistical estimation problem uh, in terms of something which already includes Markovianity and will turn out to be more efficient. So what, what is the way to go? Well, the way to go is to uh, 
use the recursion relationship. So uh, I will refresh your, uh, your memories on this. Uh, uh, very, so very early when we introduced uh, uh, the very definition of uh, the value function, this is the value of a policy. Uh, we, you might remember that uh, we derived very, very briefly uh, this relationship, which says that the value function at a given state for a certain policy uh, is the sum over actions and new states of the transition probabilities. And the actions are picked according to that policy of what? Of the current reward plus gamma, the value function at the new state. So here we have been using Markov property because what we're saying here is that uh, the expected value of my full return from a state is what I get at this step plus what I get from the next step onwards following the same policy. So here is, you really see this Markovianity. It's connecting what happens now with what happens at the next step. So, and uh, this object here, this is a linear equation. This is a linear equation for the vector V. Remember V pi is a vector so from now on, uh, since we are always using one policy, say uh, the random policy or whichever policy you want to evaluate, okay? Uh, sometimes I will drop this, uh, this pi below. You must always remember that this, depend, this depends on the policy, but since we are, we are working with always the same policy, whatever it is, sometimes I, I forget about it, okay? Or I deliberately do not put it in order to, uh, uh, make the notation uh, uh, less cumbersome. Okay. So another way of writing this uh, uh, is uh, is to use the vector uh, matrix notation. Uh, in which, uh, a, for instance, we, we introduce uh, uh, a vector, uh, a row vector, so all the things we already did in previous uh, lectures, okay? I'm just re refreshing them to you. You can define a row vector, which is uh, the sum over new states uh, and actions according to the policy uh, of the rewards, okay? So this object is uh, the expected reward from state S, okay? Expected because you pick action A according to pi and you a return action as uh, state as prime according to P, and then you get the reward, small average reward, small R. And then you remember we introduced also the transition probability across the states, which is uh, exactly what the name means. So what's the probability of jumping from S to S prime under the policy pi? And if we use these objects and we see them as a, row vectors and the square matrix, matrices, matrices, that's you want matrix. Uh, the, uh, the recursion relation that you have here actually uh, is rewritten in this following form. It's just like uh, the transpose, so this was not a row vector, it was just a vector, a column vector. So R transpose, which now is a row vector, is equal to V transpose times uh, the identity matrix minus gamma P. And this is nothing but uh, rewriting this equation in a slightly different form, uh, rearranging terms, by putting uh, uh, V on the, uh, on the same side as, uh, uh, so sorry, putting gamma on the left-hand side, the gamma term on the left-hand side, and then replacing the quantities, okay? This is absolutely equivalent to the other uh, equation which has been uh, 
looking red. Why do I do that? Just because this highlights uh, the linear algebra nature of the problem, okay? So here, this object is a, uh, this one is a invertible, if gamma is strictly less than one square matrix. Okay, so this is a row vector and this is a known in MDP, okay? In MDP, this is a known uh, vector. And in MDP, this matrix is known, okay? And this thing is your unknown. So calculating the value function in MDP is a linear algebra problem, evaluating the value function. Given a policy, you, be, you construct this uh, row, this, uh, sorry, this rewards vector and this transition matrix, and you just by linear algebra, whatever method you like, you solve this problem. Now, the question we are asking is, can we solve this linear equation without knowing what's the matrix on the right-hand side and what is the vector on the left-hand side? Okay. The way I see it, I say it does, doesn't make sense, right? Uh, but I have to make, make it a more careful statement. So can I solve this linear equation without knowing what the right-hand side and the left-hand side are, but having samples of these things? So if I replace uh, the matrix and the vector by some samples of these matrix and vectors, can I solve for the value V? And how do I do it? How do I guarantee that my algorithm will solve this problem uh, exactly if I have sufficient number of samples? You see, we're trying to solve an equation but now in a, in a sense of a stochastic term, okay? We're trying to solve an equation stochastically. So uh, everything we will be doing from uh, now to Friday will be exactly this, using the recursion equation to solve this problem. This, this technique, this overall technique goes under the name of temporal difference learning. Okay, so what we do now is uh, we, we proceed in the following way. So uh, for now, I will just sketch what is the idea, how to do it, okay? Then tomorrow, uh, we will discuss the mathematics behind this idea in a simplified version, okay? So we'll sort of consider a, a, a toy problem of this stochastic approximation. And we will see how to prove that this method is actually sound. And then we go back to the full problem of learning the value function, okay? Because these techniques, uh, which uh, rely on the concepts of stochastic approximation, are much broader in scope than uh, learning the value of function. So we use them for this particular purpose, but as we, as we will see, they are much broader in scope. And they are definitely one of the, uh, the tools that must be in your, in your conceptual toolbox. Okay, you must know what that is and why, it's, why it works and why is that, that is important. But since this requires a lot of math for today, uh, I will devote just the last 15 minutes in order to set up the stage for this, for this map. So tomorrow we will just go to demonstration. So uh, what is the general idea? Uh, the general idea is the following. <laughs> Let's go back to this, uh, to this equation here. Okay. And we are gonna massage it a little bit. We're gonna rewrite it in a different form, which uh, involves 
the idea of sampling. Okay, so we're gonna re remove in a way the parts that we don't know, okay, which are these two. This one is, is in our control, okay? So we don't, that's not really a problem because we provide the actions because we know them. But what do you know are the, the P's and the R's? So we're gonna rewrite this in a way to eliminate, in a sense, this and replace them with sampling quantities. And this will be the, the cornerstone of our algorithm. So how does that work? Well, first step, we just put uh, everything on the same side, okay? So we're gonna say that this uh, recursion relation is also equal to, okay, I'm, I'm basically doing nothing here. I'm just rewriting this as a, as follows. And this has to be equal to zero. So let's let's check what has happened here. Very little, but something has happened in the sense that uh, uh, here I had uh, the value here was uh, on the left hand side. I moved it on the right hand side with a minus, and I also put it inside the, the summation. Okay. Compare this with this. Now the value function has come inside the summation. Why is that possible? Well, just because if I forget about everything that is in the square bracket and I consider only these two objects, if I sum them over S prime and A, this gives one, okay? So note, sum over S prime A, P of S prime S A, by SA, this is equal to one. Why is that? Because these are probabilities. So if I sum over actions, the sum over actions in pi gives one, okay? So these and these, they give one, and the sum over S prime gives one. So all of this is one. So that's why I can pull the value inside the square bracket, okay? Nothing very fancy so far. But here comes the very simple step, but which is uh, fundamental. Remember, this, uh, this, this is valid for all S, right? This is, uh, these are, these are cardinality of S equations. Okay? I'm not summing over S, I'm just considering this for every S. So this, Recursion is also equal, corresponds also to the expectation. If I take actions according to the policy, so let's say if I pick action A according to my policy, if I take a state S according to my transition probability and also the rewards, Of what? Of just the reward minus, sorry, plus gamma, the value in the new state as prime minus the value in the previous state as, okay? Condition on the fact that the new state is equal to us. So if I want to put explicitly the times, this would be the state as t, the time t plus one, the reward t plus one. So maybe this is even more transparent. This is equal to zero. Okay. So do you see that this line here is the same as this one? But only that now I've expressed this implicitly as an expectation value over the policy and the model. Okay. So uh, this object here, uh, which appears here in the uh, under the expectation value, 
is a very important object uh, which uh, has its own name. It's called delta t plus one. That's the symbol for this. It's a stochastic object because it depends on the, the current uh, uh, sequence of states, actions, and rewards that you that you observe. Uh, and uh, it's called the temporal difference error. This stands for temporal. And this stands for difference. So why, why is this a temporal difference error? Okay, so let's have a look at it. Uh, so we can rewrite this delta t plus one as the current reward minus the value function in that state minus gamma the value function in the subsequent state. Okay, this is just a, a very simple rewriting of this term in which I collected the minus sign in front of this. So, and when we write it like this, we see that, okay, this is the actual reward at time t plus one. So when we have the sequence S T A T S T plus one, and this is the expected reward. This just follows from the definition of the value function. Because the value function is the expected reward. So the expected reward from the state st minus gamma times the expected reward from the next state is exactly the expected reward. You just have to look back at this equation here, okay? So that's the meaning of V. So in the sense that this is, or better, rather than, so let, let's use properly, more than expected reward, this is the estimated reward according to the value function. So that's why it's called an error because it measures the difference between uh, what you actually observe and what you estimate on the basis of the value function. On average, these two things are the same. Okay. That's why this uh, equation is uh, the recursion equation is also equivalent to this. The expectation of the error is zero according to your policy. This is just manipulation of the equation, but it's, in, it's instructive because it tells you that this term, you can interpret it in terms of, of a difference, which uh, stochastically may, may change from uh, realization to realization, but on average, it must be zero if this object is the value function by definition. So what, what have we done here? Well. Uh, we have transformed our set of equations, of linear equations, which is the recursion relationship, into a set of stochastic equations. Okay. Now we don't have any longer the value expressed uh, in terms of the coefficients of this equation, but we, we know that on average, the value must satisfy some condition. Okay. So, so this, this, uh, this way of writing the recursion uh, uh, equation here. So the way we, we interpret this is this is a condition on the value function. The value function to be the proper value function of that policy, it must satisfy this statistical condition. Okay. So why is this why is this interesting and important? Because this gives us an idea about how to solve. 
And here is the following. Suppose we start with a guess for our value function. So we don't know what the value function is. And we start with a guess. And we compute the temporal difference error for this guess. On average, it will not be zero. Because if it were zero on average, this would, have, this would be my exact value function. And my problem would be solved. So I, I try with some value function and I know that on average, there will be some discrepancy. So my average temporal difference error, maybe, maybe it's larger than zero. And this is telling me that my first guess was pessimistic because it was predicting a reward that is smaller than the reward that actually my policy gives. So maybe I can use this for, correct, for correcting my estimate. Okay. So the qualitative idea is that even though your equation is now purely stochastic, it still provides you information on how to correct your estimate. Okay. That's, that's the first insight into this. But a deeper insight actually comes uh, if you think uh, about uh, a simplified version of this problem. So I will introduce this now and tomorrow we go into further detail. So, so let's unpack this. Uh, so what is the idea? There is the following. Uh, if you look, uh, suppose you, you want to just uh, look at the oversimplified version of the problem, which is just uh, one dimensional. Okay, it doesn't make sense for any Markov process, but just let's abstract away and think about a simple problem. So what would, would this be? Okay, so the recursion relation means that uh, uh, if I write it, it's just like uh, R transpose, I rewrite it here. Okay, this is the matrix equation. Now suppose that uh, this uh, horizontal axis represents my value functions. It's abstract, okay? And so I am here, this is my reward. And this is a linear object which cuts it off like this. And so this equation, if I think of it, uh, it's just a, like a hyperplane intersecting a vector which gives me a vector as a solution, okay? That's the geometrical interpretation of linear equations. And I'm just, considering a sketch of this thing in, uh, in one dimension, okay? So uh, I can also write, it, write this down in the other way, like I did before, just like uh, RT uh, plus gamma uh, VTP minus VT equals to zero, okay? Which is again, the same thing. So let's redraw this object. So this would be my delta, my expected delta, okay? So how does this look like? Well, in terms of the value function, well, I have to do R minus that. So this is gonna be something like this. So here is my true value function of the policy. And now this true value function is here. So this V is the space of all possible vectors. And this V pi is the only vector which truly is the value of my policy, okay? And which is the one that I want to find. So uh, if uh, I am an MDP, okay? If the problem is an MDP, well, I just have to find this zero, but I know what the line is. So I know what this object is because I know the coefficients of this line. I know this and I know the intercept. This is what an MDP looks like. Finding the zero of an equation, if you wish. In this case, it's even a linear equation. What we want to do now is uh, to replace the knowledge of this line or stochastic approximation. What stochastic approximation does is that I don't know what the blue line is, but I can interrogate my system and get some samples. So I want to find the green point here 
without knowing what the blue line is, but I can ask my Oracle to produce samples that are on average on the blue line. So if I'm able to come up with an, alg with an algorithm that solves this problem, where solved means that I have to specify under which sense, on average, in probability. So the strongest thing would be, can I find an algorithm which uh, with probability one finds my true zero of my equation without knowing the blue line, but just knowing that on average, my red points are around the blue line. And how fast is this? Okay, so these are the kind of questions that we have in mind. So tomorrow we will see how stochastic approximation works in a simple one dimensional problem like this. And we will see how this is connected to stochastic gradient descent and to other important concepts in machine learning. They are actually the same thing. So, and then when we've done this, when we've completed this part, we go back to our full multidimensional problem. And therefore we can formulate our strategy for temporal difference learning for the value function. So that's the plan, okay? Any question about the outline? Okay, so be prepared. Tomorrow morning, there will be a first hour, which would be mathematically heavy. Okay, we're going to take all the steps, but it's, I think it's a good investment because uh, I, I'm not sure you, 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 I think that you are probably have been exposed to the notion of the stochastic gradient descent, but I'm not sure if anyone has proved to you what are the conditions for convergence of stochastic gradient descent. And that's what, our lecture will also provide tomorrow, okay? Fine. So with that, uh, uh, any questions, uh, doubts, complaints? Not for today, tomorrow, yeah. Okay, so if not, that's not the case, uh, have a nice day and see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, thanks. Thank you, bye.